Welcome to the third season of That's So Second Millennium, the Catholic science podcast where we explore the fascinating borderlands between science and theology through realms of philosophy, human experience, and more. Welcome back to That's So Second Millennium, episode 128. In this episode, we have the privilege of introducing you to Society of Catholic Scientists conference speaker Tim Dolch from Hillsdale College. He's an astrophysicist who specializes in radio astronomy. We strongly recommend you go to the catholicscientist.org website and look up his talk from this year's conference. We get the chance to discuss more with him about his everyday specialty of radio astronomy and astrophysics. We discuss the history of the field, and we also discuss the role that the search for extraterrestrial intelligence has played in the development of radio astronomy, which is a fascinating story in itself. At the end, we also discuss a little bit about his experience teaching at a school like Hillsdale, which is a liberal arts college dedicated to uh, student education, and how it plays, how it interfaces with his research career. We really enjoyed having the chance to have this conversation. Tim Dolch, I can testify, is a great guy. I actually roomed with him <laughs> at the 2019 conference. So it was great. It's, it's great to be able to go to uh, a place like the Society of Catholic Scientists Conference and wave hi to people. And uh, it was great, again, to be able to do that now that it's 2021 and we're starting to be able to do that. I'm really grateful for that. So without further ado, here's our conversation with Dr. Tim Dolch. So welcome back to That's So Second Millennium. We are extremely pleased, Bill and I, to have uh, Dr. Timothy Dolch on the program. He's an assistant professor of physics at Hillsdale College in Michigan. He received his BS from Caltech and his PhD in physics and astronomy from the Johns Hopkins University in 2012. Before joining the faculty of Hillsdale College, he held postdoc positions at Oberlin College and Cornell University, both with the North American Nanohertz Observatory for Gravitational Waves, or Nanograph, as it's known to its friends. In Nanograph, he chairs the Education and Public Outreach Working Group. He's also a research scientist with Eureka Scientific Incorporated. Primarily a transient radio astronomer, his research focuses on pulsars and using them as tools to detect gravitational waves from merging supermassive black holes. He's an author of 49 refereed publications and has taught courses in quantum mechanics, general relativity, computational physics, and astronomy. With Hillsdale students, he constructed the low-frequency all-sky monitor and on-campus radio telescope. Professor Dolch is a member of the Society of Catholic Scientists. Welcome to the program. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Bill. Thank you. So this is this is really an honor. We're, we're we're tickled to have you, and you had a great talk that I would recommend. Um, we'll probably show it uh, multiple times to recommend people to go to the CatholicScientist.org website and look up your talk on uh, on uh, contacting or looking for signs of extraterrestrial intelligence using radio waves and other. Um, I think there was a few other uh, discussions, but mostly radio waves, since that is your your area of specialty. So um, yeah, and uh, and looking at your your uh, your bio on the, actually on the Hillsdale website and uh, and the um, another place that you linked from there. Um, I was really intrigued by your discussion of of being you know building a, a radio telescope and as a uh, um, as a youth. <laughs> Maybe we could just start there. How did you get? Uh, I would tell tell us a little bit about your little bit about your background and how you came to decide to study astrophysics and radio astronomy. Sure, uh, and and thanks for that and. And thanks for having me. This is um, this is really fun to be doing this. Um, I was never uh, not interested in astronomy and space. You know, I, I don't really remember a time where I wasn't. Um, I uh, I grew up going to a lot of uh, science museums, science programs. Um, my dad's a retired teacher, and he was the uh, director of uh, science education in in his district, so he had those things, you know, on his mind educationally. Um, but I I hit this uh, this time when I was about fourteen or so, when I got really really taken by by nature and physics and astronomy uh, for some reason, 
And one of the things that that happened was I bumped into uh, a member of the Society of Amateur Radio Astronomers, which is an organization. It's um, largely ham radio enthusiasts who then get interested in using their equipment for doing astronomy, radio astronomy. Uh, and through one of the educational programs I had done, um, a still dear friend of mine got me very interested in building backyard radio telescopes. And um, I did that for two high school science projects and, and the rest was history. Uh, and it's very intriguing to me and still is that the radio wavelengths are the one other than optical where you can really do it yourself, you know, without mm -hmm. going into a space-based observatory or something like that. Yeah. And amateurs, which is a positive term, of course, love of the subject yeah. can yeah. really make a contribution. Yeah. Well, and, and amateurs in astronomy, both in the visual and in the optical and the radio uh, spectrum are, are immensely important in a way they aren't necessarily in other sciences. That's right. So how could you, I mean, I assume you've had contact with amateur astronomers of the other uh, persuasion. Um, how, how, uh, how difficult is it to build your own radio telescope compared to, I, I have to admit as a kid, I was daunted by the prospect of, uh, of trying to build my own telescope in the optical range of the spectrum, um, lens grinding and whatnot. And, you know, maybe the books that I had were a little old and a little overly ambitious, but. I actually think it's easier to build a radio telescope than an optical telescope because there are kits out there. Mm -hmm. There are a few different groups that, that make these available. Uh, one mm -hmm. of them is called Radio Jove, which is is named after the fact that it is designed to pick up uh, bursts of emission from Jupiter. That's a, mm -hmm. that's a common phenomenon in the solar system. And it can also get bursts from, from the sun, radio bursts. Mm -hmm. uh, those are pretty inexpensive, and you can do some real science with them. So that's, uh, that's the way I would go personally. Mm -hmm. It doesn't How look as pretty in your backyard. It looks like a bunch of clotheslines. But... <laughs> Yeah. yeah. It takes a little bit more explanation for people to realize the caliber of science that you're doing. But yeah. How how much of the sky does uh, one of these setups like actually probe? Right. Well, it depends on the setup and there's there's many different ones available. Um in that particular kit, uh you can roughly point in the direction of Jupiter. Okay. Um so you're looking so you set it up to point to the south because it's mm -hmm. going, to, you know, at at its uh, highest altitude angle, it'll 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 cross the meridian toward the south. So that's if, if you're a northern hemisphere observer. Yeah. So so you set it up that way um, to be roughly directional, but it doesn't actually need to be super directional to work out well because mm -hmm. you can so identify things in the spectrum. Yeah, you can, you're, we're talking half the sky rather than a square degree or something like that. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Is it possible with research grade telescopes to get a finer um, cut of the sky and get more directionality? Oh, Is absolutely. That, yeah, yeah. If, if you look at the, the world class radio telescopes, uh, in fact, those are the best for zooming in on things. Uh, mm -hmm. If you, you saw the. Um, Event Horizon Telescope's results from two years ago of the first black hole picture. Yeah. That was using a network of radio telescopes uh, around the globe mm -hmm. and using them in conjunction with one another, which is, is called an interferometer. Yeah. And you can use an interferometer to uh, essentially have a, a telescope as wide as you space the telescopes, uh, the yeah. individual antennas apart. So the collector telescope is as wide as the Earth. And that's why it was able to to zoom in so uh, finely on that mm -hmm. that structure around the the supermassive black hole because that that picture is about the the width of the diameter of the orbit of Neptune, mm -hmm. but it's in another galaxy, right? <laughs> Something 
30 AU in radius and it's in another galaxy is pretty hard to pick up. Yeah. Yeah. Gosh. Yeah. So, I mean, the definition of a parsec is that it's one arc second, an AU of one arc second, you know, of, 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 you know, coverage in the sky. And that's not very far away. And yeah, right. that galaxy was how many, how many parsecs, a, me- a megaparsec? Uh, several megaparsecs. Several megaparsecs. Yes. Okay. Yeah. 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 Gosh. Uh, yeah. The things that we can do even just compared to 30 years ago, it's, it's really amazing. It's really amazing. So, um, and, um, gosh, this is, this is a question. This is almost really personally a Paul question. I I hope it's of broader interest than just me, but (laughs) the society of Catholic scientists has the great uh, virtue of bringing me in contact with people well outside my own scientific discipline. And so, uh, and that's included a lot of people who call themselves astrophysicists. And I find myself sometimes surprised by the term because my, you know, my own uh, internal, some, somewhere along the line, probably in about 1995, I internalized the definition of you astrophysics, you're looking at stellar objects. Um, and then there are people who do study cold molecules and the you know, inter, uh, interstellar medium and things like that. And there's some astrophysics? People who study exoplanets, that's astrophysics? What, what, uh, for someone who's inside the field, what are the bounds of astrophysics, broadly speaking? Well, the distinction is more historical than anything else because of course astronomy mm-hmm. uh studying objects in the night sky right is the oldest science many thousands yeah. of years old before yeah. physics even existed as mm-hmm. as we know it today mm-hmm. there was astronomy so in principle what it's supposed to mean is that if you're doing pure astronomy you're uh, studying phenomena in the night sky or day mm-hmm. sky in radio astronomy, and you're reporting on it. Mm-hmm. If you're doing astrophysics, supposedly, you're doing physics calculations of some phenomenon in the universe outside the Earth. Mm-hmm. Um, but really, in practice, there is no distinction. Everyone does a little bit of both because you can't okay. do astrophysics without some data from the yeah. sky ultimately. Yeah. And you can't take data from the sky that's not motivated in some way from from physics. Right. So, uh now the only meaningful boundary I can tell is that when you submit to AAS journals, American Astronomical Society, mm-hmm. for a paper to be published, there's AJ, the Astronomical Journal, and mm-hmm. there's APJ, the Astrophysical Journal. Right. And they decide which one it belongs in more. Okay. Okay. As far as I can tell, there's no other meaningful distinction there's, between them. there's 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 a sorting algorithm somewhere that has that has developed to to just sort them one way or the other. And there there they go. I think so. Yeah. Oh, that's whether whether it's some sort of massive uh, data science. This 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 smells like astrophysics, this smells like astronomy. I'm gonna send them this way. Or whether it's just a, a Supreme Court justice type of person, you know, saying, I think, you know, I, I don't know how to define it, but I know it when I see it. That's right. <laughs> that's, that's a good person. Yeah. Uh, so, um, so, so we mentioned the importance of, I mean, amateur astronomy and especially amateur radio telescopes. What, what are the, could, could you describe some things? You know, over the history of, of radio, I mean, how, how far back does the study of radio astronomy per se go? And then what, what is the role of amateurs been down the years? Right. Uh, radio astronomy began in, in 1933. Uh, Carl mm-hmm. Jansky was an American electrical engineer working for uh, Bell Labs. And he had various antennas set up to discover sources of interference in telephone transmissions. And he accidentally discovered the radio emission from the plane of the Milky Way galaxy. It was moving through his antenna uh, twice a day. Right. And he identified that. Okay. But from very early on, radio astronomy was tied with amateur astronomy because the second big name in radio astronomy, Grote Reber, who was uh, from Illinois doing the next stage of radio astronomy and identifying particular sources. Uh, he did all that from his backyard. 
and he set up his own equipment and he published his results. Uh, but that was entirely his own uh, self-funded effort. Mm -hmm. So from the beginning, it was very much tied with amateur radio operators. Uh, now, after World War II, there was this great infrastructure throughout the world of giant antennas that had been set right. up for the war. Right. And so uh, countries in which those were, were very present quickly got really good at radio astronomy. Mm -hmm. uh, like Britain, Netherlands. That's right. The UK mm -hmm. and the Netherlands and Australia all really yeah. started becoming leaders in radio astronomy um, to the point that Green Bank Observatory in, in West Virginia, one of our mm -hmm. flagship facilities uh, in, you know, for, the, for the U.S., was started in the 1950s because there was this sudden panic that the U.S. is behind in radio astronomy. Right. And we can't have that in the 1950s. The U.S. has to be first in everything. That's right. That's yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah. It's still kind of true. But yeah, there's, there's still that, that sense among a lot of people. Uh, yeah. So what, I mean, so in, um, to my limited understanding, you know, in optical astronomy, I mean, what part of the value of amateurs is we simply don't have enough telescopes to be looking at every single part of the sky. And of yes. course, that, that brings the, the, the question of, um, you know, so people can observe variable stars and all sorts of things that are not so exciting that they necessarily get funded. But there are people who just have the interest and have the telescope and are, you know, watching, not alcohol, obviously, that's probably, well, may, maybe even... But, uh, you know, variable stars, you know, on the 750th variable star on the list and say, oh, look, this is doing something interesting this year that has never been observed before. And it can get it can become, you know, the, the, it's, it's this big trawl trawler bringing in data from all over the sky that wouldn't be collected otherwise. It was just just the funded research community um, with radio astronomy, with the question of, um, you know, limitation of um, field not being an issue. What does that, uh, what do amateurs continue to contribute to the discipline in, in that field? Right. Well, there are coordinated projects that are using these smaller facilities. Uh, Radio mm -hmm. Jove is the one I was mentioning before, yeah. and there are others. Yeah. Uh, that, that do find um, really interesting phenomena that precisely because of their numbers, because you have a lot of small setups, you know, no major observatory is going to see. Um, and in fact, not all of them are astronomical. Some of them are meteorological uh, in the Earth's ionosphere, because the ionosphere is the charged part mm -hmm. of, of the Earth's atmosphere. It's very uh, electromagnetically active. Um, mm -hmm. Ultimately, you know, the aurora are, are part of that, that whole process. And there are strange things that happen in terms of radio emission uh, from the ionosphere all the time. And, and so some of these groups have uh, identified things that, that are probably ionospheric phenomena not entirely understood yet. Um, one of them are called TPs, because if you look in the radio spectrum, they kind of mm -hmm. rise and fall and, and create okay. a okay. diagonal pattern. Um, they, have and, a, and they have a central frequency and then big shoulder to either side. That's right. So, uh, you know, so it's and it's still not entirely clear what a lot of these phenomena are. Sure. Um, and in, in meteorology, there's a lot of phenomena that are probably related. If you heard of the uh, sprites and blue jets. Yeah. These are fairly recently discovered uh, large scale atmospheric energetic phenomena. Um, and so there are uh, radio aspects to these classes of phenomena as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so this is all Earth's atmosphere and magnetic field interacting with the solar wind primarily, maybe the cosmic, cosmic uh, particles as well? Well, there's, it's, it's, it's largely activated by, by the sun and, and, mm -hmm. and solar the flares and things like that. Yeah. Um, but the ionosphere can respond to those, for quite a long time. It's not just, oh, there's a flare and that's it. Um, mm -hmm. And then the it's, ionosphere has these different layers and, and it, it, you know, some people devote their whole careers to studying the ionosphere. So there's, there's a lot there. Oh yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. And, and there's the, I wonder if this is, I find myself thinking about this again after, you know, not, you know, after a brief pause, probably of 30 years and thinking about, you know, the 20th century description of like bouncing commercial radio transmissions off of the sun layer in the ionosphere. And I wonder if that's even, if that was an oversimplification or if that's more or less accurate that, that some of the oh, that, that's very accurate. in the uh, ionosphere are actually reflective at certain radio frequencies. That's yeah. right. And especially at the lower radio frequencies. So um, once you, you start to get below about a hundred megahertz, uh, the there's and you know, and especially once you go down to AM frequencies, there's there's a lot of that bouncing happening. In fact, the window of about uh, one gigahertz or a thousand megahertz to ten gigahertz that's kind of the window where you're not very influenced by the ionosphere. So that's okay. where a lot of radio astronomy is done. Okay, okay. I guess I I can't go too far down the rabbit hole. I suppose of all of the I, I could ask a lot of physics and engineering questions and uh, it kind of get us maybe a little bit off track, but uh, um, so your, 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 uh, telescope set up at Hillsdale, um, could you describe a little bit about that and what it, what it, uh, observes? And, and if you said you were doing some projects with students, is that uh, a summer project for some students there as well? That's right. Uh, yeah, the, the telescope we have on campus is called the low frequency all sky monitor mm-hmm. and it's 13 antennas and it taken together. It's one station and there are five stations uh, around the country uh, and so the telescope was originally designed and the other four stations were were built by some colleagues of mine at the uh, university of texas rio grande valley okay and so we're, we're the fifth station and mm-hmm. we have a very wide view of the sky uh in the sense that we're, we're not very, we're intentionally not very directional um right. but we have a very wide uh, bandwidth. So we're, we're taking data from 10 to 88 megahertz and we stop at okay. 88 because that's the beginning of the FM band. Okay. Um, there you go. Yeah. 88.1 megahertz. You're picking up, you know, smooth jazz or something. That's right. <laughs> that's right. That's right. I, I was going to say the, the classical station there. There you go. There you go. Um, yes. 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 Indeed. Yeah. That's a good place to stop, I suppose. That's right. <laughs> um, so it, it's a very wide spectrum and, and very finely channeled in there. So you can see in terms of the radio spectrum, um, really detailed information. Okay. And basically we collect data 24 hours a day and then go back mm-hmm. and, and look for events. And so the idea of the telescope is to, to see unanticipated uh, bright radio emission. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And what we have seen so far i mean first of all we saw our uh, first light objects these are very well-known objects that we just wanted to make sure we saw you know as a sanity check right. uh, first of all we saw the galaxy passing through every day just right. like carl jansky originally did that's always that's the first check you do with a radio telescope if you don't see okay. that something's really wrong something's really wrong yeah okay um and then we we made a sky map and one of our antennas is much further away from the others and that inferometry technique i was telling you about where the wider you you spread antennas apart the more you're you're magnifying the sky basically yeah and with that we we made an all sky map and it's interesting in in radio the sun is very dim if you make a sky Uh map with the sun in it you're not going to see it there unless it's bursting Okay. Um, okay. The two things you see, the two brightest things you see in the radio sky, if you just map the entire radio sky, are Cygnus A and Cassiopeia A. They're named after the constellations they're in, but Cygnus A mm-hmm. is um, the emission from nearby a supermassive black hole in a, yeah. uh, uh, a, a galaxy nearby us. And Cassiopeia A is a supernova remnant. It's a uh, okay. very electromagnetically active remnant of a uh, exploded star basically mm-hmm. it's the guts of a star that are mm-hmm. still uh, uh not cooled down mm-hmm. and those are those and those two showed up in the map when we made we made so that was that was another that's a good start happy thing to see yeah um but in terms of the 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 transient phenomena we're looking at and you know like i was 
saying back at the conference that this is this is the blanket term for when you, when you're looking for time changing stuff yeah. in the sky that's that's unanticipated. Yeah, it was a transient phenomenon. Now, the stuff we've actually seen are probably ionospheric, but that itself has has been pretty interesting, and I've I've gotten mm-hmm. into the literature from that. Uh, there are some uh, there are some digital TV transmissions that are not obviously local that seem to uh, interact with the ionosphere once in a while. And, the, and, and this is the thing, if this happened all the time, it wouldn't be very interesting, but it tells you there's some configuration of the ionosphere that's, that's letting a, a bounce happen. And because we have these detailed uh, spectra, you can see all sorts of um, structure to this. So that's, mm-hmm. that's um, what students and I have been working on. Um, you can also see some radar sweeps in the data that come from far away. Uh, which is another, and that, that, again, that's not, you know, the sort of astrophysical source that you're you're dreaming about, but at least it's telling you, <laughs> there's, you know, there's definitely not a um, uh, military radar in town here, so you you can right. tell your 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 instruments working. That's right. If there's a if there's a submerged uh, North Korean military submarine in Lake Michigan, by God, we want to know about it anyway. So yeah, that's true. Right. <laughs> um, it, well, and it's. <laughs> And, and those radar sweeps don't come all the time. You see them once in a while, which tells you, yeah. that there, you know, again, there are these interesting uh, ionosphere configurations that that you can probe with this instrument. Mm-hmm. So that's that's what we've been having fun with recently. Mm-hmm. But but in general, uh, you can make your telescope more sensitive. And in, in terms of well, if you have a big dish, you make the dish bigger. And if you have an array of individual antennas, you add more antennas. Mm-hmm. Uh, so the sort of state of the art of this of this kind of telescope uh has hundreds of antennas yeah and 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 there are several telescopes like this in the world one is in uh, new mexico it's called the long wavelength array and this has 512 of those antennas so then you can you can really um focus on individual faint objects that way uh, such as pulsars Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. individual pulsars often though somewhere in the galactic disk i guess that's right. Yeah. 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 So you mentioned the two brightest objects you said were Cygnus A and Cassiopeia A are set. Which what's the, the galactic core of our galaxy? Is it Sagittarius? A? Sagittarius A star. It's a, a star. radio source right there. Okay. Okay. As that's, opposed to Sagittarius A. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Uh but yeah, but that's the radio emission from the region immediately surrounding the, the supermassive black hole in, in the center of our galaxy. Which would probably be hard to see because it would be embedded right in the middle of the galactic disk. So, exactly. Yeah, or the, the, the plane of the galaxy, which is as we, the, the very first detected radio astronomy emitter. Yes. Or collective emitter. Yes. Um, wow. So, so the sky is, is fairly busy and the ionosphere is very busy. So that's a constant... I mean, that's a constant battle to, to try to distinguish whether you're getting something directly from space as opposed to something that's been mediated through the ionosphere. That's right. Can but, radius. you know, your, your signal is somebody else's noise and your noise Always. is somebody else's signal. So right. you can be annoyed by the ionosphere at certain frequencies or you can start studying it. Right. Right. Yeah. You can start watching how it, it behaves and it's certainly going to be transient and it's going to be localized. That's another thing that I suppose would come into play is that yeah. If you're seeing something and Texas is not, you know, oh, okay, it's this patch of ionosphere, maybe. Yes. That's 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 behaving differently. Um well, I mean, so the 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 uh, subject of the conference and the the point of departure for your talk was actually the question of uh looking for signs of extraterrestrial intelligence, or at least maybe if <laughs> extraterrestrial uh, beings that can emit radio waves in some way, shape, or form, uh, probably not as a mating ritual, uh, but, uh, but probably due to <laughs> probably due to some intentionality on their part. <laughs> you never know. I mean, that, I mean, <laughs> the reasons for um, transmissions could be anything. So, you know, that right. could be parts. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Starship Enterprise encountered, encountered some like you know nebula like beings that I suppose you, know, you couldn't necessarily rule that out, but at our level of knowledge, that seems seems unlikely. <laughs> I, I think Paul is pointing out there one of the takeaways that I had from your talk: the difference between techno signatures 
and biosignatures. Right. Uh, yeah. yeah, I think what Paul was alluding to there would be more of a biosignature. Biosignature, yeah. Your, yeah. your expertise is particularly in the techno signature. Okay. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. So the biosignatures are are the signs of any kind of life. Um, and techno signatures are specifically the the signs in astronomy of intelligent technological activity. So you know, biosignature um, would be, for example, finding some sort of microbial life in our solar system, which is not yeah. uh, a, a crazy possibility to think about um, when you look at the, the warm subterranean oceans and some of the outer solar system moons. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, but then a techno signature is specifically something. Uh, that you need technology to detect. So it's, uh, or to, to produce rather. And so you could have plenty of intelligent civilizations out there that don't have technology. You know, maybe, right. maybe they all um, choose not to do it for whatever reason, but we wouldn't know yeah. about that. So you have to assume that the ones that were, we would detect would be uh, technologically advanced enough to produce some sort of signature of that technology. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and inclined to do so. We certainly seem reasonably inclined to do so. I think you were discussing what would, what, what would the conceivable distances at which, you know, our own techno signatures of our current uh, civilization be potentially detectable at. Yes. So what was, we, there, there are at least nearby star systems, probably not actually inhabited by people who are, who are by creatures who are, who are looking for us, but, uh, but, uh, but at least several light years out at this point. That's right. Uh, you can. There's, there's a, there's a back of the envelope calculation mm -hmm. um, where in a pretty decent fraction of the nearby galaxy, if there were a civilization producing the equivalent of military radar pulses or Arecibo messages, um, a square kilometer collecting area telescope on Earth could detect those, which we don't have yet. Right. Um, right. And we've named one, but we haven't built it. Yet. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Yes, the Square Kilometer Array Telescope in, uh, is being built in South Africa, and it's, it's gradually getting up to that area more and more. But right now it's called Meerkat, which is one of those astronomy uh, backronyms, you know, that right. is particularly suitable for, for South Africa. Um, right. But Meerkat, which is sort of the core of what will eventually be the Square Kilometer Array, is itself a, one of the best radio telescopes in the world now already. Mm -hmm. um, but it'll get bigger. And so that to me always plays into this question that is, is raised by, by some people like, well, people have been doing SETI for decades and yeah. nothing's come up. So shouldn't you call it quits? Well, but, but the fact is we still can't detect ourselves yet. Right. <laughs> yeah, you know, put ourselves at, at a, you know a reasonable distance from the Milky Way galaxy, yeah. we still wouldn't know about that. So, yeah, I I, I really, for a lot of reasons, and, and I'll I'll say this over and over in various ways, but I I really don't think it is fair to say that SETI's been tried and nothing's come up. I don't think we've we've really started trying yet. Yeah, we've barely tried. I mean, that would be a great, obviously, topic to sort of and 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 you know, first of all, we would want to remind people to go and look at your talk and we don't want to, you know, recover the, uh, the areas there. We definitely encourage people to talk about those, but, um, to, to, to look at your talk and, and get some of these details, but, but if there was some additional material you wanted to talk about, that would be very interesting to discuss like the, prog the progress of SETI over the last four or five decades, however long we've been doing it at all seriously. Yeah. Um, the first well, when you trace the history of this, uh, in a certain sense, the idea goes back hundreds of years. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I had prepared some slides along these lines, but I, you know, 
I didn't want to make an hour long talk when I had 25 minutes at the conference. Yeah. Um, but, <laughs> but, uh, in the 18th century, people were thinking about, you know, could you see, uh, signatures of other civilizations uh, in our solar system? You know, I mean, that, right. that, that is not, uh, a new line of thought. Uh, in the 19th century, there were several um, popular books, you know, about looking for light pulses from other civilizations in the solar system. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, the idea goes, goes back a long ways. Yeah, back when both Venus and Mars looked like perfectly legitimate targets for That's right. someone to That's right. someone to study. Uh but what we would consider the more you know systematic kind of well thought out search uh really began in in the early 1960s. Mm -hmm. And uh, Frank Drake who is famous for the Drake equation. Right. Uh conducted the first SETI survey at, at Green Bank Observatory. And th there were also, uh, at the same time, parallel efforts in the, in the Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. And there's some fascinating review papers on the history of this, because in, in, this, in, in, this, in these early stages, uh, all sorts of uh, crazy ideas were thought about, crazy in, in, in the positive sense of you know, crazily mm -hmm. clever. Um, because you have to play this game right. of, you know, what are called the shelling points in, in game theory, right? So if you, you're trying to get in contact with someone else, but you can't communicate with each other, where do you do that? Well, you go to common points of reference. Yeah. Uh, you know, if you're in, in New York City trying to meet someone, but you forgot your phones, where would you mm -hmm. go? Well, maybe uh, Grand Central Station or... So, so, you know, so, so, so what are those, you have two parties trying to get in touch with each other. Uh, and, and so there was all of this literature from those, those first few decades on, on how this might work. Um, mm -hmm. And those first few decades though, were limited by where technology was because if you look at any of the yeah. radio astronomy literature from well, before, really before the last few decades, people always talked about, well, what frequency are you observing at? You know, oh, I'm observing at 1420 megahertz. I'm observing at, you know, you name some frequency. So yeah. now quite a bit of radio astronomy is done in very wide bandwidths. Mm -hmm. I mean, even our, our modest radio telescope here at Hillsdale, I mean, 10 to 88 megahertz, we get a complete spectrum 10 times a second. I mean, that's a lot of data. You could not, 30 years ago, that was not so uh, feasible. You would have to choose a particular frequency. And uh, is, is that simply a function of our electronics becoming better? Yes. And, and computing yeah. power. Yeah. Okay. Uh, computing power. Yeah. So, so there were these searches done for decades at, at very. Uh, well thought out frequencies. So mm -hmm. 1420 megahertz is where hydrogen produces radio emissions. So maybe they would know about that and want to broadcast right. something there. Um, other natural frequencies were thought of. Um, and people did optical study as well, because the moment after the laser was invented, one of the inventors of the laser, Charles Town, started thinking about could you use lasers to send communications at interstellar distances? Uh, and yeah. there was, there was some work done in those areas too. Um, but, yeah. but that, that narrow band limitation is, and, and, and the fact that a lot of the searches were untargeted, uh, was, was a real limiting factor in, in retrospect. Um, and you can, yeah. you know, now we know, many, many exoplanets, and, and you can actually point at a particular planet and look for signals mm -hmm. there and identify them if they happen coming from that planet. Uh, that was not possible mm -hmm. several decades ago. So uh, 
I think what those decades of really hard and really clever work and, and, and I'm not even doing it justice now, of course, um, Jill Tarter, who is the founder of the, the, the SETI Institute. And, you know, she, she's who the character Ellie Arroway in the movie contact is, is oh, okay. uh, inspired by, okay. uh, you, you know, she is the reason that we have the uh, Allen telescope array, and that's the dedicated SETI instrument. Mm-hmm. And so, so these people did work for a long time, but, but just because of the technological limitations that were there and not knowing the targets, what that did was that it eliminated the lowest hanging fruit you could imagine. Yeah. You know, okay. So yeah, we know, we know we're not, living in a galaxy where uh, some little every other star is, can put out. Yeah. Yeah. Some, some, some either, either every other star or some super, some civilization is not within, you know, a thousand light years that has access to a lot more energy than we do putting exactly. out broadcasting at one of these obvious frequencies. Exactly. But, you know, other than that, there's a huge, parameter space of possible signals to still explore that has just not been been tapped yet mm-hmm. and people get impatient naturally You're like well oh, yeah. we've been at this for decades but you know some problems take right. a long time to to get the right. data for right i mean that's the that's that's one of the bureaucratic mindsets is we already have basically all the information we need we're just filling in things around the corners and we can make decisions based on the information that we have <laughs> and we don't know what we don't know yeah absolutely so so and then of course there's the question of what have we discovered in radio astronomy while we've been conducting this search right yeah and that, that's one of the beautiful things about the, the history of this field is that um there's quite a bit of bonus science that has happened through these searches you know so people say oh you've wasted your time well no you haven't if you don't detect anything because you detect all these other things um there was a a Soviet project that detected this really distant source in another galaxy that was turning on and off. It was called CTA 102. Mm-hmm. And people studied it for a while, and it turned out that it was um, what we now call a variable active galactic nucleus. Okay. And that, that's where you have a supermassive black hole at the center of a galaxy. There's material falling into it. And yeah. from intergalactic distances, you can see a flicker there. Okay. Yeah. And, but you know, you're looking for time variable signals. If you're not used to seeing this kinds of, this kind of thing, it, it, it's going to look spookily like a signal. Somebody's alien time signal. <laughs> That's right. But, but, but in fact, it was the discovery of a new, new phenomenon. Uh, similarly, more recently, there's, and this has been since about 2007, uh, there's this, really hot field called fast radio bursts. Yeah. And these are millisecond pulses of emission that typically come from other galaxies. And, and there's about a paper a day posted for somebody's theory about what these are. Um, <laughs> That's and, a lot to wade through. Yeah. Right. And now not surprisingly, uh, it has been proposed that these are technological signatures, but most people don't think that's right. Um, there's a lot about them that does smack of being being natural, um, mm-hmm. even if not completely modelable yet. Yeah. Um, they are sure. very likely extremely rare, bright pulses from pulsars. Usually, pulsars do the same thing over and over. They pulse, pulse, pulse because there's yeah. A, equivalent of a lighthouse beam that's passing the earth over and over but once in a while they just uh have this cataclysmic burst of emission and it is will still just be for a millisecond or so that's uh, so a really young extreme uh neutron stars probably explain a lot of the fast radio burst even though it's a very new field mm-hmm. um, and they're 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 not you know generally technological signatures are expected to be narrow band because that's how we communicate using particular frequencies. And these are very, yeah. these are still pretty wide in frequency. Okay. Yeah. So it could only be a techno signature if it was 
a civilization building their own neutron star, which is there you go. I mean, that's a level in Space Empires for I think if I if I, if <laughs> I right. build out that yeah. tech tree. <laughs> that's right so <laughs> it's toward the end of the game needs a lot of resources but yeah so, yeah. yeah well um, yeah i don't know, maybe right. maybe we're living in a simulation you know as they say well there's that and there's yeah. that but yeah. no but but um so so but going back to to seti so when people look for techno signatures you end up finding a lot of these fast radio bursts because your your systems mm-hmm. are sensitive to these so yeah um, the the big SETI projects, uh, the Breakthrough Listen and uh, and the SETI Institute with the Allen Telescope Array, they've published papers on the fast radio bursts they've discovered. Yeah. Um, another example of this is from from optical SETI. Uh, there were some papers that look for mega structures, you know, Dyson spheres yeah. and things like that, things that would block or change the emission of a star. Um, and there's never been anything convincing found there, but there have been natural transient phenomena that are discovered through those Mm -hmm. searches. There are um, red transients as this, this paper uh, Beatrice Villarol et al has, has found. Mm -hmm. And and they're not, um, they're they're still hard to classify naturally. So it's, you know, you're doing good science, even if you're not finding ET as it were. Right. Right. Exactly. (laughs) <laughs> and of course, the the ability of ET to build his, I think the speak and spell was a key component of his transmitter, right? Yeah. That's right. That's right. Yeah, yeah. That was that was that was kind of more of a fun uh, rather than realistic, perhaps. Uh, yes. And, and and a cornfield. You need a cornfield. Yeah, you, you need a cornfield. That's true. You need that. There's there's something about the electromagnetic background in a cornfield that just makes things think, makes things better. Um. Yeah. It's. <laughs> pop culture is but i mean and of course that's the thing that the, you know we our, our artists as it were you know shape our expectations for things and we just don't know if we're shaping them in the right direction yes um is it so so, so as an astrophysicist someone who's put some thought into the possibility of extraterrestrial life you know how different do you think that it could be i mean you know, but it'd be nice if it, you know, if it used DNA and had cells and, you know, basically was just about like life on earth, but, but how different could it be? And you're, you know, reading and thinking about the question. Yeah. And that, and that's of course, uh, vastly important for doing techno signatures because there is a selection effect. If you're looking for techno signatures, you are intrinsically assuming that on some level they are like us. Yes if they're radically different, then it's harder to imagine what to look for. Yes. This is um, a very contentious point, actually. Um, and if, if you read some of the, the writings of uh, Simon Conway Morris, who was also one of the speakers at, at the conference, I mean, he's very much of the school of thought that an independent example of the evolution of life would end up going in a very similar trajectory as we have. Um, he has a lot of examples from convergent evolution, you know, independent, very independent niches uh, in, in, in the Earth's evolutionary history where you have the same structures that develop. Um, there's a lot of classic examples like that. Uh, so there is this school of thought that says if you're going to have life, there are these very narrow bottlenecks in the evolutionary process that that you have to pass. And therefore, if there's life, the resulting structures will be quite similar. Um, on the other hand, that's all based on one data point. Right. That's the terrible thing about, <laughs> as far as we know, we have one data point. That's right. one, one cell for sure. Yes. Got started. <laughs> yes. That's so, all we really know. So I, I you know, I think uh, we still have to be very open about this. Um, this. Yeah. Uh, on the other hand, the evolutionary process is very sensitive to initial conditions. Um, you know, yeah. at, the, at the meeting, there was Chris Shingledecker's great talk about uh, astrochemistry. And he talked about the chirality mm. of, of, uh, of, of molecules and you know we have left-handed yeah. uh molecules in in life on earth and 
so that tell that alone tells you that certain initial conditions will propagate throughout the entire history of life. And you can argue whether that's really significant or not. The chirality of models. Yeah, but, yeah there's um, the, there's but, the, yeah. but on some level, it's very sensitive to initial conditions. Um, and then, I mean, that's about the evolution of life. Then you have the whole question of the evolution of intelligence, because that's, that's something else. I mean, that is, yeah. you know, certainly on, on the scientific level, we don't know really what consciousness has to do with life still i mean we know obviously yeah. if there's conscious life somewhere we would expect it to have something brain like in terms of a physical mm -hmm. structure um but it, it, it's not clear exactly why consciousness happens so you would also have to understand that in depth uh to really know what to expect in terms of an independent evolution. And of course, this has been radically explored in, in science fiction. Um, yeah. There's, there's a great um, novel and, and famous movie as well, uh, Solaris by, mm -hmm. by Stanislav Lem, who's the great Polish science fiction writer, uh, who, if you read the history of Soviet SETI, he would be present at a lot of these conferences. Uh, okay. he, he was part of the he was, he was a prominent intellectual figure in in the soviet era of, of poland mm -hmm. and in the novel solaris i mean i don't want to give a give it away here so right. I'll, I'll try to avoid needing a spoiler alert here but, mm -hmm. but basically there's a there's a radically other conscious being that's okay. so it's it's clearly exhibiting intelligent behavior Mm -hmm. but it's very difficult to conclude that it's what we would call a person. Okay. Um, but it's clearly intelligent, conscious in some way. Uh, it, in fact, I'm not giving anything away by saying that uh, it's a planet, because this happens basically at the beginning, you learn this. Yeah. It's a planet where there's an ocean that is itself intelligent and exhibits all of this um, okay. bizarre behavior and, and certain associated phenomena. Okay. So they go to this planet and they're uh, exploring all these, these strange things that happen. And that's where I won't give away anything. Right. Sure. Um, but it, there's so much about human consciousness that's very particular to us i mean for example we're very social beings fundamentally i mean yeah use of language we we have an i and a thou um yeah. we and a they and a they um so what if there's life consciousness that's not at all like that what what if there's just some fundamentally different way of being conscious than that um yeah yeah so and that would play into what technical controls it would be putting out would it be, that's be right. bothering to try to communicate at all would it would it try to communicate in a very different way would it use different parts of you know would it use the electromagnetic spectrum any other sort of communication phenomenon that we would just wouldn't think of that's right yeah and then and then you have the whole question is the electromagnetic spectrum even the right one i mean what else do we have to go yeah. with at the moment but uh, for all we know, maybe civilizations become really advanced such that electromagnetic communication sounds oh so quaint and primitive. You know, right. maybe to them using uh, gravity waves. I don't even know. Gravitational <laughs> waves, uh, neutrinos. I mean, the, the, you know, neutrinos, people have thought about yeah. that. Yeah. Or something yeah. that we have no clue about. So, um, you know, there, there are those possibilities there too. But, um, but to do SETI, you just you have to guess. Uh, and yeah. So there's that inevitable selection effect. If that is the case, then hopefully they'll condescend to put out some electromagnetic waves. <laughs> That's right. For us. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. J just just to um uh you know to see our, our cute little toddler response to, to that. Right. Yeah. Right. Uh yeah. 
Yeah, that is that is one of the sort of not always spoken themes of the conference, but just to sort of remember, you know, the hu- the humility that's appropriate to human beings. Absolutely. Yeah, and, um, I, and I think part of that humility is is uh, is waiting. Yeah, you know, you know cause I really think, at least as far as techno signatures from civilizations somewhat like us, um, you know, I think we we basically need square kilometer array level mm-hmm. campaigns on all the known exoplanets, Earth like exoplanets in our galaxy. Mm-hmm. We don't have even have that full list yet. Um, once there's a dedicated campaign like that, and if it comes up negative, then I think we can start saying, "Well, I guess we have to look I mean, toward we are that just, we are alone." Even then, we've just ruled out one tier. I mean, it's just just a question of at what point do we stop building ever larger? I mean, it's sort of the same thing for particle physics. At what point do we simply say, "All right, we've we've reached a limit where we'd have to build another order of magnitude more expensive accelerator or something to try to yes. probe this next level of energy?" Yeah, I mean, we could we could put a ten square kilometer array on the moon, and yes. that would give us more data. But at some point, we probably will stop. Right. So right. we're building our own Dyson sphere out of like you know to, to just to support the antennas. That's right. That's right. And and maybe maybe that would explain all the other um, Dyson spheres that would be discovered by then. Is that it's, it's it's other civilizations building radio telescopes to look for other civilizations. That's right. Yeah. Well, there there are some intriguing questions like that that have come up in the literature. Um, Jill Tarter, who I was talking about before, has the classic review paper mm-hmm. on the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, and um, one of the questions she asks in there is, "What if everybody's listening but no one's transmitting?" Right. So, you know, so it, it's very uh, it's a very large parameter space to put it like that. Yeah, yeah. To put it mildly, to put it mildly. Um, I was hoping we could get some time here at the end to discuss, you know, your situation at Hillsdale specifically, which is which is an interesting institution to a lot of us, and to think about, you know, doing this, you know, doing astrophysics, and you know, being really trying to be involved at the at the cutting edge of of this field, as well as working at a school where obviously teaching is paramount, and that really prides itself on, in fact, doing it a little differently than the average um, institution of post secondary education does these days. Yes. Bill, did you want to chime in a little bit on that too? Well, yes. Uh, uh, actually, I had one question uh, even prior to, to that that uh, tied in with the idea of the Society of uh, Catholic Scientists. Cool. I liked what you said early on about um, how at one point in your youth, you got really hit by uh, nature and uh, physics and astronomy. Uh, and then later, uh, later you mentioned that, uh, you know, you, uh, it was a kind of aura of great mystery when you talked about sprites and blue jets and, and those things. Um, and that seems to me to be getting really close to the kind of spirit of the Catholic uh, scientist uh, organization. Am I right? That, uh, do, you, do you find that um, those kinds of mysteries um, are more accepted in the scientific community uh, today or less? And do they make science more or less compatible with Things like uh, spirituality and faith and religion, uh, particularly the the Catholic religion, perhaps. I know mm-hmm. that's uh, Hillsdale is a is a very solidly wonderful uh, uh, secular institution that that um, that values spirit. Uh, am I right? Yes. That values the spiritual side of the human being. Yes. Uh, so uh, it's it seems as though you're 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 describing exactly that attitude toward your work. Yes, no, I, I definitely think so. Um, I think the the feeling of wonder is not to be taken for granted. I mean, it's familiar to everyone, I think. But I think that if you're a scientist with an active religious sense, you you cherish that feeling of wonder in a way that you wouldn't otherwise. 
Um, I think most people who go in to science professionally uh, have some of that, that spirit initially. But I think that if, if you're educated, I mean, particularly in the Catholic faith, you, you see that, that feeling of wonder as, as something really given to you deep inside. It's not just a childish feeling or hope or something like that. It's, it's, um, it's one of those really deep desires that is, is, is I, I think, placed in us for a reason. So uh, it's a, in that sense, it is a, a, a spirituality because you, you, you come to your research with more of a, a sense of expectation. I mean, who knows, maybe things will go well or maybe they won't. It's not expectation of, of success, you know, necessarily, yeah. hopefully yeah. you're successful, but sometimes you're not. And, you know, it's, it's doing science research is, is a, is it have, there's a sense of battle to it, you know, with, with nature and, yeah. and uh, well, the associated circumstantial things, politics and, you know, yeah. but regardless of all that, the wonder that you experience through doing all of it, um, you know, is, is very much his presence coming to you. If, if you, you can, recognize it that way that's a that's a good powerful comment yeah and and a, and a friend of mine who who was another uh astronomer who's a catholic once once said to me that you know people who well he, he was i forget exactly how he put it but he was concerned about people whose spirituality all happened inside a church or mm -hmm. in prayer he said my encounter with Christ happens when I go into my office in the morning and I first touch my keyboard, you know, because you get the moment you touch that keyboard and who knows, maybe it's responding to the first email or, you know, working on some paper draft or getting your teaching together, whatever it is, you know, if you see that, that wonder in it, the reason the, the bigger presence of, of, of nature behind it that we didn't make, you know, that is, uh, that, that there's a relationship in there, you know? Yeah. That, that, that's a, that's really food for thought. And by the way, uh, uh, it seems as though higher education is really one of the few institutions we have left that, where, where people can, uh, preserve a sense of wonder. Uh, and uh, uh, I guess uh, uh, we, we might be losing some of that in much of higher ed. And also it's one of the few places where we can uh, maintain uh, a sense of uh, conversation and community and the uh, lively interchange of ideas. And so that was the, uh, the question I was going to ask about, about Hillsdale, is, especially mm -hmm. as we're entering such a polarized uh, time in our culture and and all. Um, you know, what are what are you sensing in the Hillsdale community that uh, that speaks to those uh, those needs for higher ed to perform those functions and can can higher ed keep us going uh, without other institutions uh, helping out? <laughs> right. Well, at at, at Hillsdale, there's some. Um... There's a few things that I think make a good contribution there. Um, one is that we have uh, several times a year these things called CCAs, Center for Constructive Alternatives. And um, there are these mini conferences where a certain topic comes up and, you know, external speakers are, are brought in and, and it gets yeah. debated and, and you get to watch and it's fun. Uh, one of them, from several years ago was artificial intelligence and there's a faculty mm -hmm. panel afterward. And I, I, I was on that panel and got to give, give my take on it. And, uh, but the, the main speakers who came were, were quite a variety. Uh, one was a, uh, Silicon Valley type who, you know, um, yeah. 
very much talked about artificial intelligence and quantum computing and things like this as the future. And we need a very, very capitalistic free market economy for this to happen or the whole thing will fall apart. The next Mm -hmm. speaker said, well, all the advances in artificial intelligence will uh, be so productive that uh, we have to kind of move away from capitalism and we have to, uh, you know, have give a guaranteed income to everyone. And that should come from Silicon Valley and, you know, completely opposite (laughs) opinion. And, you know, uh, of course, one one of them, I won't say which was a little more cheered than the other, but, but, you know, everyone got their say and it was a great conversation. So um, I I thought that was unique. Uh, And then in terms of education, um, one of the the things I think that's unique about, about Hillsdale is there's a core curriculum. So there's a variety of courses every student has to take uh, in, in humanities and sciences and social sciences. Yeah. Uh, and that includes physics. So even if you're majoring in English, you have to mm-hmm. take one semester each of math, biology, physics, and chemistry. And it's that, it's, it, it's that, that hope that uh, everyone can really learn the, the panoply of uh, you know, knowledge that came out of Western civilization, basically. And, and so, so that's what, uh, that's what we go for. And it goes both ways. You know, you, you have physics majors who will say, Oh, why do I have to read Jane Austen? And you have English majors, right. you know, who, Oh, why do I have to calculate this orbit? But you know, <laughs> that, in the end, that's great. That's what right. you, want. you know, if you, right. you, you, um, you grow by learning something that that stretches you beyond your own immediate preferences. We, you know, I, I certainly have many times in my life. Yeah. 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 I think, yeah, that's the real challenge of higher ed. I think going forward, isn't it? Uh, to, to preserve that breadth and depth in the right proportions and, and allow students to maybe feel frustrated uh, that they're not getting uh, just, uh, they're just not going down one rabbit hole of, of knowledge. But uh, they, they should welcome uh, the the way that everything connects to everything else, as uh, yes, as Steve Barr likes to talk. Say yeah. yes, no. yes, and and I should also add. I mean, it's it's not a matter of learning a wide variety of specialties either. I mean, I mean, you 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 do this in order to to feel a kind of unity emerge from all this, and um, yeah. and I think you know the the human being fully alive intellectually uh, needs all of that. You know, um, you need to have some background in um, literature, philosophy, theology. Um, And you also need that natural science because, you know, you, you, you can philosophize about the fact that man is the one being that looks up at the stars, but then if you don't look up at the stars yourself, you're not experiencing that. Either. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so, so it's, they, it's a, they, it becomes a platitude. Yeah. That's right. So, the, so they intertwine, you know, the, the, the more, um, you know, reflecting on things that are, are not seen and then, and, and that are, you know. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Those are good, good thoughts. Yeah. Um, I, I had one last question and this is another one of those, you know, Paul has this question as much as anything, but um, you know, so, so you're again at a, at a, at an institution with a somewhat different focus, you know, if you were at the university of Michigan, you'd be, you know, your days would probably look different than they do at Hillsdale trying to do, you know, even, even though you might have the same research specialty, you might even be teaching the same classes, you probably wouldn't be teaching as many. And the, and the, um, the balance has got to be different. How does that, how has that played out for you as someone who obviously has been through, you know, you've been in contact with a lot of people who are on that, you know, trajectory, who are living that, you know, particularly research heavy lifestyle. How have you, um, 
where are you at on your journey in terms of like how how is, how does this work out for you in your career? Well, I'm I'm fortunate in that department because, as it turns out, uh, radio astronomy is very student friendly. So, uh, I'm able to mm-hmm. integrate quite a bit of what I want to do research wise with things uh, that you know, are part of students' education here. Mm-hmm. Um, every physics major and, and every science major uh, does a senior thesis project, you know? So yeah. um, that involves doing some actual research. And uh, mm-hmm. so and we, we've done that in the, in, in the summers and, and often through the school year too. And, and that's, uh, that's really valued amongst my external colleagues um, in, in the, uh, the nanograv collaboration that I work with. And this is something we haven't talked about too much, but this is uh, using pulsars as a tool to detect gravitational waves. So for that, we've yeah. used the, the Green Bank Telescope in West Virginia and the former Arecibo Observatory. Yes, uh, we'll get, very We can do a whole, a whole hour on that too, but sadly yeah. it's, it, it collapsed, but historically we used it quite a bit. But I mean, we have, uh, I think at one point recently, it was 1,300 hours a year on these telescopes. It's probably bigger now. Mm-hmm. That's a lot of observing time. So uh, we actually got students to control those two giant radio telescopes remotely and take the data. Mm-hmm. Uh, and And that was... That was just a fantastic arrangement for everyone involved. The students got to do some cutting edge science and and really be in the hot seat. You know, you have to uh, you have to initiate observations. Yeah. Where, you know, or they don't happen, and it's kind of scary when you're sitting in that position. Uh, and and obviously we need that that data. Yeah. So, um, so for particular pockets of of astronomy not just radio astronomy, but it's particularly true in radio astronomy. Um, Students can get really involved in, and, and in the nanograv collaboration, there's, there's actually a lot of uh, liberal arts or teaching oriented colleges that have been involved. So, you know, it, Mm -hmm. it, it's, it's a matter of um, taking one's research in a direction that, that students can follow you in. Mm-hmm. Do you find that staying in contact with the cutting edge of research helps you as a teacher? I mean, this is kind of an old question, but how does it play out in your career? Oh, absolutely. Um, because on the one hand, it, it keeps me excited about, you know, the, the newest things going on. I, I tend to hear about them pretty quickly. And uh, yeah. in fact, sometimes I will, I will talk about them too long to students. You know, I'll get, I'll get so excited about them, but you know, I mean, Austin temptation, but if I don't, yeah. that's right. But if I don't yeah. feel that, then it's like, well, why, why am I doing this? You know? Um, yeah. and so, so that's, that's, that's part of it. And then, uh, and I think it also, from the standpoint of uh, having physics majors who do more advanced projects, you know, I, I, I can, uh, really get them in a position to get involved with cutting edge research. And that, that's part of their curriculum, you know, mm-hmm. and, and it's, it's pretty, particularly important for graduate school applications as well. Well, thank you for taking all the time that you have around our microphone. Yeah. Yeah. We really appreciate the, uh, the chance to, to, to go into these into depth with these different topics. Thanks for listening to this episode of that. So second millennium. TSSM's audio producer is Morgan Burkhardt. Our theme music, Igneous Grok, was composed and performed by Vin Marquardt. For my co-host, Bill Schmidt, I'm Paul Giesting. Until next time.